Naku, may init-init pa guys I have with me here the soft copy of the exam on the law pertaining to private, personal, and commercial relations At kasama dito ang civil law bar exams So, tingnan natin ang mga questions at sagutin natin ang mga ito Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. This is the House of Law and I am Attorney Al Jumrani. And yes, you heard that right. My init init pa. I was able to get a copy of the uh, questions no, for the law on uh, private, personal, and commercial relations. Now, if you have uh, watched my previous videos on these bar exams, ang civil law bar exam ay nireduce na at 12 questions na lamang at kasama siya ng commercial law bar exam. At ibinigay siya kaninang umaga February 6, 2022. So kaya tingnan natin yung mga tanong at ibibigay ko aking um, suggested answers. Ngayon, bago ako magpatuloy, uh, gusto ko lang uh, batiin ang mga bar examinees no, nitong 2020-2021 bar exams ng congratulations. You have finished this very difficult and challenging journey. So, as a rule, dapat hindi kayo nagpo-post game analysis, no? Hindi nyo dapat uh, chine-check yung sagot nyo doon sa questions. But this one is for academic purposes. Now, if you are unsure of your answers, this may confirm your answer, no? Ngayon, kung sa tingin nyo, naku, hindi tayo parehas ng sagot, don't fret. It doesn't mean na mali kayo. Kasi ako rin naman, hindi ko masasabi talaga 100% na tama ang sagot ko. Because the answer that matters is or are the answers of the examiners. So your answer is only as good as mine. Pero you know me, I, I teach the subject, so these are my suggested answers to the questions related to civil law. Alright, so simulan na natin. Okay, so babasahin ko ang tanong and then followed by my suggested answer. Okay, question number one. A couple executes a prenuptial agreement which principally provides that their marriage shall be valid for only five years, but that it can be renewed through mutual consent negotiated at least six months before its expiration. Is this contract valid? Explain briefly. My answer is, no, the contract is not valid. Under the family code, a prenuptial agreement is a marriage settlement that can only treat of the property relations of the spouses. It cannot provide for the validity of the marriage because that and its nature and consequences are provided for by law. Alright, now let's go to question number two. A corporation which owns a hospital was sued along with a physician for medical malpractice. The corporation moved to dismiss the case, arguing that it was only the physician as the natural person who could be the subject of any kind of suit. In other words, the corporation argued that it was not a legal person. Is the position of the corporation owning the hospital legally tenable? Explain briefly. Yeah, so this is my suggested answer. No, the corporation's position is not tenable. Under the civil code, a corporation is a juridical person granted with a personality by law to enter into contracts, own property, and to sue and be sued. In this case, the corporation owning the hotel is or hospital pala is not only vested with legal personality but has in fact been allowed to operate the hospital. Ayan. So let's now go to question number three. A wife was able to validly obtain a judicial declaration of her husband's presumptive death after he had disappeared for 10 years. She then remarried in accordance with law. To her surprise, a few years after her marriage, her first husband reappeared. Does the first husband's reappearance automatically without need of any further act terminate the second marriage? Explain briefly. Okay, so this is my suggested answer. No, the fact of appearance of the first husband does not automatically terminate the second marriage. Under the family code, the subsequent marriage shall be terminated only after the recording of an affidavit of reappearance executed by the absent spouse in the proper civil registry. In this case, there was as yet no affidavit of reappearance filed. Alright, so let's now go to question number four. 
Two college sweethearts were married inside a Roman Catholic church in the Philippines with a Supreme Court justice serving as solemnizing officer. A few years following the ceremony, one of the two filed an action for the declaration of nullity of marriage on the ground that the marriage was void ab initio because it was solemnized inside a Roman Catholic church by a Supreme Court justice and not by a Roman Catholic priest. Is the position legally tenable? Explain briefly. So my suggested answer to this question is no, the position is not tenable. Under the Family Code, a Supreme Court Justice is authorized to solemnize a marriage anywhere in the Philippines. He, she may solemnize outside of the court if a request is made for the purpose. Besides, even assuming that the place of the marriage ceremony was irregular, this is a mere defect that does not affect the validity of the marriage. All right, so let's go to question number five. A 12-year-old seventh grade student living in the company of their parents bought or brought a gun owned by the father to school. With it, the student shot a classmate who had been a bully. The student missed sparing the bully. The bully's parents, incensed by the event, sued the parents of the 12-year-old 7th grade student for damages. The defendant parents moved to dismiss the suit, claiming that they could never be held for damages since they did not shoot the bully themselves. Should the motion to dismiss be granted on this ground, explain briefly. Very interesting question. All right, so my uh, answer is no, the motion to dismiss should not be granted. Under the civil code, the parents are vicariously liable for damages arising from an injury caused by their minor child who is living with them or in their custody. In this case, the requisites of vicarious liability are present. Very simple. Okay, question number six. A 100-year-old tree inside a university was uprooted by strong winds caused by a super typhoon. This was despite the university's prior efforts to maintain the strength of the tree's roots. The tree was blown away until it hit a nearby fast food restaurant where a bar candidate was reviewing for the bar examinations. The bar candidate, who was then the only person dining inside the fast food restaurant, suffered physical injuries. The super typhoon was enabled by climate change. Can the university be held liable for the physical injuries suffered by the bar candidate? Explain briefly. All right, my suggested answer is no, the university is not liable. The cause of the injury was a fortuitous event. Under the civil code, a fortuitous event is an unforeseen and unexpected occurrence. Or even if foreseen is impossible to avoid. In this case, the university could not have foreseen that the tree would be uprooted. Also, it must be noted that the university was free from any participation in the aggravation of the injury or loss, as in fact, it even tried to maintain the strength of the tree's roots. Yeah. All right, so let's go to question number seven. Four siblings co-own a two-hectare commercially viable property located next to a major road. The siblings have equal shares but none of them have exerted any effort to partition the property. A large retail conglomerate then offered to purchase the entire property. Three of the siblings were willing to sell but one refused, wanting to hold on to the land in memory of their departed parents. The three willing siblings proceeded to sell their respective shares in the property to the large retail conglomerate. After the sale, the conglomerate filed a case in court to partition the property. Should the court allow the partition? Explain briefly. So my suggested answer is, yes, the court should allow the partition. Under the civil code, Co-owners of a property owned in common only own an undivided interest or share in the co-owned property. If any of them sells his or her interest or share to a third person, the third person only acquires the undivided interest or share from that co-owner seller. And he becomes a co-owner up to the interest or share acquired. Then, as a co-owner, the third person can demand the physical partition of the property. Thus, in this case, the large retail conglomerate has become a co-owner with the fourth sibling. Thus, it can demand the physical partition of the property. Alright, so now let's go to question number eight. 
Believing that a parcel of land was public land, a farmer built a two-story concrete house on it. Five years later, a person showed up bearing an original certificate of title over the lot which had been registered for more than 10 years. The person asked the farmer to vacate the parcel of land. The farmer refused to vacate unless the titled owner pays the fair market value of the house built on the parcel of land. Does the farmer have legal ground to demand payment for the house before vacating the parcel of land? Explain briefly. Ayan. So my suggested answer is yes, the farmer has the right to demand payment for the house. The farmer is a builder in good faith. Under the civil code, a builder in good faith is a builder that had no notice of any defect in his right or title to the land. A builder in good faith is also entitled to reimbursement of both useful improvements and necessary expenses. In this case, the farmer was a builder in good faith before he was informed or notified by the true owner thereof. Also, the two-story concrete house is a useful improvement. Under the civil code, a builder in good faith has the right of retention until he is paid or reimbursed the value of the useful improvements. Ayan. So that's my suggested answer to question number eight. Let's now go to question number nine. Your significant other shows you a laptop screen on which a mandatory question for the installation of an app appears. The question reads, do you agree to the terms and conditions of use? There are two buttons indicating alternative responses. One is labeled agree, the other is labeled disagree. The terms and conditions of use are not shown on the screen. Neither is there a hyperlink that can be clicked that would reveal the terms and conditions of use of the app being installed. Curious why the terms and conditions of use are not available, you search the internet and come across media articles revealing that the terms and conditions of use allow the app provider to access a user's contact list, emails, and browsing history. These pieces of information are sold to advertisers who in turn tailor their emails to users so that they can engage in targeted advertising based on the user's profiles. Knowing that you are taking the hashtag best bar ever 2020 underscore 21, your significant other asks you this legal question. By clicking on agree, will there be a meeting of the minds between the user and the app provider enabling access to the user's contact list, emails, and browsing history? Explain briefly. All right, very interesting question. And my suggested answer is no, there was no meeting of the minds in the present situation. Under the civil code, there is meeting of minds when there is an agreement on the object and the cause. In the present situation, there can be no agreement when the terms and conditions are not even displayed or shown. That I, the bar candidate, discovered the effect thereof by my research from the internet and other media articles does not cure the defect. It did not dispense with the duty of the app provider to inform me of what I was about to agree to. Ayan, so that's my answer to question number nine. So let's now go to question number 10. A Japanese national was able to obtain a divorce decree concerning his marriage with his Filipino wife. The decree capacitated the Japanese national to remarry. Can the Filipino wife now avail of Article 26 of the Family Code and then remarry? Explain briefly. Now, this is a very familiar question dahil na itanong na to nung 2019 bar examinations. So anyway, let's uh, see. This is my suggested answer. Yes, the wife of the Japanese national can remarry. Under Article 26 of the Family Code, as interpreted in the case of Republic versus Manalo, a Filipino who is divorced from a foreigner spouse abroad, which divorce capacitates the foreigner spouse to remarry is also capacitated to remarry, provided that the said divorce decree is recognized through a petition for the purpose filed in the Philippines. All right. Right, so that's question number 10. Now let's go to question number 11, second to the last okay, of the civil law questions. 
A bride declined to appear on her wedding day. Instead, she sent a note to her prospective groom saying that she needed to be honest to herself by admitting that the institution of marriage was not for her. The bride wrote that she came to this conclusion after contemplating on the tweets of the hashtag LabGuru. She also wrote that to atone for her non-appearance, she would post a glowing recommendation of the prospective groom as a partner on her Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok accounts. The couple had previously dated for almost eight years. The whole time, the prospective groom had been loyal and caring. It was the bride who covered all the wedding expenses. Heartbroken and embarrassed, the prospective groom sued the prospective bride for moral damages, alleging that she had breached her promise to marry. Will the suit prosper? Explain briefly. Well, my suggested answer is no, the suit will not prosper. A breach of promise to marry is not actionable. However, for it to be a case of abuse of right, the civil code provides that the person performs an act which, although legal, prejudices or harms another. There must be ill motive or intent, and there must be some pecuniary damage suffered. In this case, the would-be bride has a change of heart, which is absolutely legal. And there was no pecuniary damage caused to the husband-to-be because after all, it was the bride-to-be who spent for the wedding expenses. All right, so let's now go to the last of the civil law-related questions. Okay, question number 12. A seller posted an online advertisement for a four-volume set of Tolentino's commentaries and jurisprudence on the Civil Code of the Philippines, 100 pesos only. A bar candidate excitedly ordered it and paid through GCash. However, when the set was delivered, tears started to well in the bar candidate's eyes. Much to the bar candidate's bewilderment, the author was not Arturo Tolentino, the legal luminary as the candidate was made to expect, but Lorna Tolentino, the noted actor. The bar candidate believes that the contract of sale should be rescinded and that damages are also proper. Is the bar candidate's position legally sound? Explain briefly. All right, so my suggested answer to this question is, yes, the contract of sale can be rescinded and damages are proper. Under the civil code, rescission is implied in reciprocal obligations. Under the civil code, rescission is implied in reciprocal obligations. Rescission is proper when the debtor fails to perform its obligations, such as in this case. The buyer ordered Arturo Tolentino's civil code book, but what was delivered was Lorna Tolentino's book set. Further, damages can be proper in case of bad faith or fraud in the performance of the obligation. This can be presumed in this case because it was clear that the buyer was a bar candidate looking for law books and not just any law book but the civil code book set of the legal luminary Arturo Tolentino. But what the seller delivered was not what was ordered very far from it. So clearly there was fraud, there was misrepresentation and thus the seller is liable for damages. All right, so those are the civil law bar questions in this 2020-2021 bar exams. So uh, this is my take on these exams at yun po ang aking mga suggested answers. So again, uh, minadalilan natin to, no? Hopefully, uh, yung ating mga bar examinees uh, can compare their answers to my suggested answers. But like what I said, right now, magpahinga lang kayo. You enjoy this achievement because this, you know, uh, taking the bar and finishing this journey, that is an achievement in itself. So anyway, if you are new to the channel pala, and also, bago ko nga makalimutan, uh, bago ko nga pala makalimutan, uh, if you are not a law student or not a bar examiner or a lawyer, you will notice how I answer the questions. No? In answering law questions, law school bayan or bar examination questions, you always start with your categorical answer. You always say yes or no. And then you follow that up with your legal basis. Kaya napansin nyo sa mga sagot ko, laging may under the civil code or according to the family code. And then after stating the legal basis, and then you apply it to the facts of the case or of the question.
So there you go. Uh, if you like this video, please uh, give it a thumbs up. And uh, if you have not subscribed yet to my channel, please subscribe to my channel. And please click that notification bell so that you will be notified of my next video. There will be more videos coming up. So I am excited to be seeing you again soon. So till my next video, this is Attorney Al. Laging tatandaan, isip e buksan, alamin ang batas. Bye guys!